third panel, I forgot for a minute which panel we're for the third panel of Rice Sweet. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, we are thrilled to have a lot of repeat customers here and some new faces. Before we begin, a huge thank you to HowlRound, who's live streaming this right now. Um, and also a big thank you to the Dramatist Guild, whose lovely space we are in right now. Um, so just a few things when we start. Please turn off and, or silence the cell phones, but feel free to tweet because I will be right there, and some of our panelists might be as well. Um, if you want the Wi-Fi password, I'm going to give it out right now, so be at the ready if you need it. It is drama with a capital D, then in all caps, Gil with an exclamation point. Um, so feel free to tweet and all that jazz. Also, we do have one final panel tomorrow night, and that's back at the ranch at Samuel French, so please join us for that. And be sure to get a copy of our white paper on the way out, which has more information on anti-piracy. So to kick it off, I'm going to turn it over to Sam French's lit manager, Amy Rose Marsh. Thank you. And um, let's do it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so thank you, everyone, for coming, for coming to our third panel, which is um, on publishing our work. But it, it's an interesting panel because it's not, I think, what we conventionally think of as publishing your work. So we're not going to talk about, you know, uh, Sam French necessarily, or MTI, or RNH, or DPS. We're going to talk about um, how the internet has kind of affected the publishing world and new platforms for digital script sharing. So, um, so what a playwright can do to get their script out there electronically, and kind of new ways of communicating with theater enthusiasts about new plays. Um, and with me, I have some very brilliant minds, some very um, innovative minds that are kind of on the forefront of digital sharing. And I'd like to introduce them and read to you um, some snippets of their bios. Uh, so over here to my right, uh, we have Gwydion Sullivan. And he is the author, he's a playwright, and the author of Butcher, Reels, Hot and Cold, Extract Nude, Let X, The Faith Killer, and Cracked. Um, Wendy and lectures on theater and technology. He's the director of New Play Exchange. And you also work with National New Play Network. And he's also on uh, the DC representative for the Dramatist Guild, correct? That's all right. So he's here a lot. <laughs> <laughs> right a um, recent engagements include South by Southwest, the Dramatist Guild National Conference, TEDx Michigan Avenue, and TEDx WDC, which I'm assuming is Washington, DC. Yes, yes, indeed. yes. Um, his commentary often appears on HowlRound in The Dramatist and at his website, which is www.sullivan.com, but you should look at your form because his last name is, n is not how you'd think it would be spelled. <laughs> so, um, and then oh, next to Gwydion is Martin Denton, um, who I hope all of you know Martin was the founder of a very influential theater review site, um, New York... Um, Theater.com. Yeah. And uh, has recently launched a platform, Indie Theater Now, which is an online publishing platform that exists digitally. He'll talk a little bit about it later. Um, in addition, he's also edited 14 print anthologies. Um, he's the founder of New York Theater Experience podcast series, which has been on the air since 2006. Um, he's also received numerous awards, uh, including a New York Innovative Theater Foundation Award and an Our Town Thanks You Award for a service to the Manhattan theater community. Um, then next to him, we have a pair, uh, Kate Kerrigan and Brian Laddermilk, um, or Kerrigan and Laddermilk, who are a <laughs> music theater duo. Uh, they're also the founders of newmusictheater.com which, uh, well, you'll talk about it, but it's, it's for sheet music and digital exchange of sheet music. Um, and they also have a number of shows, including Henry and Mudge, the unauthorized autobiography of Samantha Brown, Tales from the Bad Years, and Republic. Uh, and then lastly, we have Sean Patrick Flavin. Flavin, thank you. Right. I'm sure you can pronounce his name correctly. Yeah. I, practiced. <laughs> I practiced. Yeah, it's pretty obvious. <laughs> um, so Sean Patrick is the Senior Vice President of Theater and Catalog Development at Warner Chapel Music. He's a writer, composer, orchestrator, conductor, producer, and music publisher. He's a music administrator for Sondheim, uh, Lopez, Kit and Yorkie, Miranda, and others. He also manages the song catalog of the majority of the Great American Songbook. 
Additionally, he serves on the board of the Music Publishers Association, the ASCAP SNC Committee, and the Drama Scale the Anti-Piracy Committee. And he had a wonderful article on HowlRound.com today, which I'd encourage you all to go and read if you haven't already. It's great. And I hope you talk about some things that you, you wrote in that article earlier sure. today. Um, so I kind of want to talk, I, I briefly mentioned what you guys do or what your platforms are. Um, and so I was hoping that we'd go around and you can give us a bit more of an in-depth introduction. Um, kind of where did these ideas generate from? How did this new play exchange started? And kind of what the goals of these digital script sharing services are? So yeah, we can start with sure. you, I think. Yeah. So the new play exchange is a new platform designed to transform the way plays and playwrights on the one hand and producers, theaters, uh, on the other hand, connect with each other. Uh, it is being developed by a consortium of nonprofits uh, the National New Play Network, Chicago Dramatists, Playwrights Foundation, uh, uh, Playwright Center in Minneapolis, and Literary Managers and Dramaturgs of the Americas, and uh, under the auspices of NNPN, the 70 theaters that make up the NNPN network. Uh, essentially, it's a national database of new plays. Uh, playwrights have one place on which they can upload their scripts and tag them with keywords and cast and genre and that sort of thing. Uh, and then it's a robust set of search and filtering tools that uh, play, that theaters and contests and et cetera can go to look for work. It's intended to replace the submission process, right? Mm -hmm. That's the old technology, and we are upgrading it with the new play exchange. So you could talk a little bit about that upgrade. How is it? Yeah, so you know, right now there are about 15,000 makers of new work in the United States, just for example, and they are making an average of one new piece a year. At the same time, there are about 1,500 world premieres every year in the United States. And we have technology that filters 1,500 out of that 15,000, and that's the submission process. And it's broken for everyone, and we've tried to patch it with agents and submission windows and fees and contests, anything and everything we can do to kind of make it work and jury rig it, and people still hate it. Nobody likes the 1,500 that end up on stage. Everyone's got quibbles with it, and literary managers and dramaturgs are sitting behind stacks of plays that are so heavy they can't see over them that you know, they have to eat their lunch while they read, and life is horrible. Um, playwrights are searching out there in the wild, trying to find places to share their work, and they're kind of, it's kind of a madness uh, to keep up with where they're distributing their work. And theaters are, over, well, overwhelmed with the submission. They're, they're not actually using the submission process to find work at all, even if they keep their submission process open. They're actually finding new work by networking and relating to, you know, doing searches among their friends by emailing their contacts and their lists. And that's the real way. So we wanted to say, hey, if that's the real way, let's use technology to enhance that real way and actually get playwrights connected to that process in a more holistic uh, way. So we talk about the new play exchange as a neutral platform built for the common good of the American theater. And just, um, just to clarify, this is a platform that's open to all writers. All writers, yeah. yes. Well, right now we're in beta testing. Uh, so we're only open to writers affiliated with our partner organizations and theaters affiliated with our partner organizations. Um, but we're actually looking to move up our timetable because people are like, let me in, let me in, let me in, and we want to let people in. Um, and so far the beta testing has been really smooth. There have been very few bugs. Uh, so that uh, we just want to open the doors quicker. So we're hoping to move up what was going to be a January open to the entire world to sometime earlier in the fall. Right. And so Martin, you have a similar, um, it is also an electronic script exchange in a way. Um, no, in a can, way, Can yeah. you talk about kind of how Indie Theater Now started and what, what, where the idea came from? Yeah, I'd love to. Yeah. Um, so I, I'm the executive director of a nonprofit company called the New York Theater Experience. We've been around since 1999. And um, for the first 15 or so years, or maybe not quite 15, first 12 years or so of our existence, we were basically running a website called nytheater.com, which was a listings and reviews website focused on the New York theater community, and in particular, niching the indie theater world. Um, it was, we learned quickly that the productions, the, the artists and theater productions that didn't have budgets to be Broadway shows or off-Broadway shows were the ones that we would do the most good for. And so um, we spent most of our time and resources over the years on nytheater.com uh, getting working with and promoting the work of these thousands of other artists who are in the indie slash off-off-Broadway world. And <clears throat> at the same time, we had another project in our company, which was 
uh, the annual Plays and Playwrights Anthology, which started in 2000. And in that, we were able to publish about eight to 10 plays every year uh, from among the many, many plays that we saw every year. And uh, at least, basically, our idea always was to be the point of first publication for emerging interesting playwrights. So we were the first people to publish playwrights like Ken Urban and Queen Wynne and Mike Liu and Saviano Stanescu and Chiori Miyagawa and um, missing, you know, 150 other people um, um, who, you know, I think it was, you know, it was, it was a great start for their career, and we always made it a point not to publish more than one play by someone because it's so expensive and so costly to produce and market um, a book, a real book, um, that one a year was all we could manage. So as technology came along and the internet evolved and life evolved, um, in around 2011 we had the idea to sort of marry our two skill sets and create this new website which is called Indie Theater Now. So we're actually just two weeks away from, or three weeks away from our third birthday. Wow. And Indie Theater Now basically combines our ability to publish plays, but we're doing it electronically, so that instead of publishing eight plays a year by eight different playwrights, in less than three years, we've published 955 plays by 596 playwrights. So we're able to get a great deal more work out in front of the public than we ever were able to afford to do in the print medium. Um, in addition, the mytheater.com part of the expertise, which had to do with not only reviewing theater, but also interviewing, art, interviewing playwrights and other artists and doing the podcast, as you mentioned, and a whole bunch of other things, profiling artists, so that we can provide background and context about all the work that we publish, um, and that still happens. So, for example, we're about to start for the 13th year in a row to review every show in the New York International Fringe Festival, which is a great source of where we meet new playwrights. And uh, we have a staff of about 100 amazing theater artists who are volunteer to help us do that kind of thing throughout the year. And we've been doing that, like I said, for 13 years. So Indie Theater Now is sort of a marriage of the reporting and providing context and background and, and educating and exploring and helping people discover what's great in the theater scene, especially in the indie theater community, and this idea of putting the work out on the internet, the scripts themselves, so that people can read them for themselves. Now, we are not, um, we, we, we are a curated site. Um, either I personally have seen the work of the playwright or someone already on the site has seen the work. So we're not, um, it's not an open submission process at this point. We think that's important because we want to make sure that we are able to maintain a level of quality that, that we understand. Um, we do not give anything away on the site. Well, we give lots of free content away on the site, but we don't give away people's scripts because we think it's really important that the playwright's work be valued, even if they're a playwright whose work has never been published in a book, has never been on Broadway, never been off Broadway, which is what just about all of our playwrights are. So we charge $1.29 or a little less for subscription plans per play, and playwrights get 30 cents every time that we sell one of their scripts, which admittedly is not a large amount of money, but it's something. And the playwrights, um, I think, really value the fact that they're getting checks, um, where before they weren't getting checks. So, so that's kind of cool. And um, one of the things that we're really encouraging is trying to build an audience, and this is the big challenge, is to get the word out about indie theater now and get people to understand what it is we're trying to accomplish for these folks who mostly don't have representation of any kind or mostly just starting their careers, or even mid-career people who haven't yet hit it, you know. Um, and uh, trying to get the word out so that people that are in positions to help those people with their career find out about their work, discover their work on the site, and we have had some success. We've had, we have right now, I think, probably what's arguably our biggest success to date, which is a play called The Curing Room, which we actually published right when we started by a guy named David Ian Lee, who is a local playwright who has since moved to the Midwest because he's uh, getting his MFA. And this is a play that he asked that he asked us to publish on the site. We were thrilled to do it, and he got um, a booking at some, from someone who read it on our site. Uh, it's at the Edinburgh Fringe. Um, it looks like it's going to be a hit at the Edinburgh Fringe, and it's booked for a tour in Britain after that. So this guy, who has never made any money as a writer, is making you know some money as a writer, and that's that's beautiful. <laughs> and he's getting some renown, and we're selling copies of the script to other people as well who are learning about the work. So I'm really excited about the fact that that's happened. And I know that there's two of our playwrights in the room. I might be more. I just haven't seen you guys, but um, oh, wow. it's always nice to, to see them wherever I go. Are there more than two? <laughs> three? Are there three? There's three. 
Um, Sorry. <laughs> I wonder why, so, so both, I'm assuming, and you guys are just dealing in plays or musicals? Plays and, and plays? musicals. Yeah. Plays and musicals. And are, do you represent musicals as well? I mean, we, we have musicals. It's hard. Musicals require other kinds of yeah. uh, presentation than we're technologically able to do. So um, we do have some with like links to where you can find the music. Great. That's a good segue. Absolutely. Actually. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's a great segue um, into newmusictheater.com. Um, new Musical like, Theater. New Musical <laughs> Theater.com. Uh, and so can you guys talk for our audience that may have never been to the site or experienced the site, just what is it? How did it start? Um, uh, well, we actually, we started from a different place. Um, Kate and I were specifically just setting out to solve some very specific personal problems we were having, um, which was professional problems. Professional personal problems. Professional personal problems. <laughs> <Yes>. professional <laughs> personal um, problems. Professional personal problems. Um, namely, that there were, we had a, it was a lovely problem to have, which was that um, people wanted to sing our songs, um, and we wanted to allow them to do so. Um, we had started out, I started out um, mailing people uh, music and having them mail me five dollars in the mail. Um, and then the internet <laughs> caught up to And then the internet got there and we started using PayPal and we would have people um, and I would email someone, the, uh, someone would uh, place an order via PayPal on our rudimentary website, um, there's probably like GeoCities or something, and then someone would, uh, and we would send them yeah. the sheet music. And everything sort of came to a head one one Shabbat night <laughs> when <laughs> Brian was with his family. It was like family. Passover, it was and I was sitting down with my, and my phone just keeps ringing, and I like answer the phone, and someone's like, oh, I can't get the sheet music to such and such. And they definitely thought they were talking to someone in the Philippines. Or yeah, so yeah. They, you know, they thought they were talking to some customer service person somewhere. But it's just me. And it was it's just, just Brian. Me. And so Brian said, I'm happy, yes, I'm happy to get you your sheet music. I'll do it as soon as we finish dinner. And, <laughs> and they said, wait, who am I speaking to. Like, and well, this is like, there's, there's no Brian, one else. It's like, Brian Loudermilk. Who else would it be? Me. So that was the moment when Brian came came back to the city after his family Shabbat <laughs> and he and he turned to me and he said, we have to find a new solution. There has to be something else. We have to do something else. This has to be electronic. So we started looking for platforms to make it electronic and, and find a way to um, sort of expedite the process of someone would like to buy our sheet music. We would like to give it to them in a PDF form. We and would like that to be in a protected form. Yeah, and that was one of the biggest hurdles, was that we decided that we wanted it to be protected in some way. And so... We reached into our pockets, and we, um, which I can't believe we had the foresight to do, but, like, we did, and we worked with this lovely um, web programmer, tech guy named Scott Mevis, and uh, we set about building a platform for our website, and we had very specific things we knew we wanted, such as a robust set of search criteria. Um, we were coming from the place of, let's assume that people knew enough to come here, but not enough to know what to do once they got here. Let's really lead people through and give them... We had the goal of promoting our back catalog in addition to the one or two songs that might have been driving traffic there. Um, so we focused on those search criteria, and we focused on a really simple um, encryption packet that's just based on, you know, we uh, we, pa we password protect it with the credit card and we embed it with the name of the person who, um, the, we embed it with the name of the person who purchased it right on the music. Um, standard stuff, but, um, but kind of amazing that we could just do it ourselves. And yeah. um, around that time, we started to be aware of the fact that we were not alone in needing And we kept getting this. questions from other, other writers who were similarly positioned in their careers or, you know, just a little bit behind us in terms of audience. Um, and they, they were asking us how to do what we were doing, which at the time was, you know, emailing a PDF to someone. And it wasn't, we didn't have a good solution either. So as we started developing our solution to our own problem, we started looking at other writers who might also want the same problem solved. Yeah. And we we started with five other writers and teams. Bench Pasek came on, um, of the writing team, Pasek and Paul came on board with us at that mm -hmm. point, and his dad's a lawyer, so he helped us like, <laughs> do, <laughs> do that stuff. Um, yeah, and we, we started with six writers and mm -hmm. rather quickly uh, built up to 
like 30 and now we're wait, like 50 somewhere around there yeah how, does um, it, um, how do you make your decisions as to who's on the site is it um, that has been a tricky team? thing to figure out because um one of the we learned all kinds of things in these first couple of years of having this business like a we learned that it was a business um and b <laughs> we, we, we had to do accounting like accounting <laughs> like just very quickly we were, i remember like in the first month like having a conversation with kurt deutsch who runs shikaboom and like and he thought we were adorable and we're talking about these things and he just just like said something to us about, I can't wait for your first accounting quarter. And we're like, what is he even talking about? And then we're like, hurt accounting. Um, yeah, but that there, it turns out that there, it wasn't like free to expand it to other writers and having writers on our site who don't sell content is actually a great cost to the site. Interesting. Yeah. yeah, it doesn't like effortlessly just like expand. I'm probably saying so, something that's obvious to lots of people who <laughs> from, actually from the business know side. About business. We're just like, oh, we'll just have all of the people who write musicals <laughs> be on this site. And that um, was true. Which would be great if we were if it was a not for profit, but our idea was that because we we were coming out of everyone place where we were saying we as writers want to make money on this, we believe that the site should be something that is a for prop it's selling something it's yeah. not it's not just for the it's for the good of writers but it's it's supposed to be for the good of writers like it's it's to sell your work it's to say i make a living and we do make a living from our writing yeah and and so i think that um one of the things one of the things we've been trying to figure out uh is we've been trying to sort of find that sweet spot between um the commercial side of things and the artistic side of things and that's true in our writing and that's true in newmusicaltheater.com that it, you're you're always sort of trying to find that you're trying to make sure that whatever you're putting on the site is sellable but at the same time has artistic merit and is and and, yeah. and it's just sort of some sort of weird algorithm yeah. of that. that that's, yeah. that's kind of an interesting, because I want to talk to you, Sean Patrick, a little bit about the article you wrote today about monetizing content online. Mm -hmm. And so writers that aren't um, on newmusicaltheater.com or don't have the beta code yet, or aren't, um, there are ways to monetize uh, putting your material online and kind of making sure it's protected. Can you talk a little bit to that and kind of what you recommend in terms of if I was a new writer and had no agent and no idea what to do with my script, what sure. do you recommend? Yeah, there are a number of ways to do it. Uh, you know, as the as the distribution channels have changed and broadened into a lot of different things. You know, obviously we're not just selling discs via re, you know brick and mortar retail. So, um, in the same way that publishing rights have a number of components to them, you have a mechanical com royalty component for selling. A recording of your work, whether it's a download or a disc, you have a performance through uh, generally through ASCAP or BMI or CSAC. Uh, you have a synchronization if it's used in a, a film, TV, video game, advertising use, that sort of thing. Uh, there's and of course now there's all sorts of digital uses which sometimes cross over with those rights. You also have print rights which. Uh, for the theater world, there's still quite a bit, quite a lot of value, as they just talked about, in having sheet music. It's the primary way that that music is transmitted from one to another because it's generally involves a, ultimately a live performance. Mm -hmm. um, and so the digital sheets business has has exploded, especially in the last few years. Um, so I think for somebody who doesn't have representation or doesn't have uh, uh, a relationship with Brian Cater or any of the number of other sites, uh, there are a number of ways to do it. Obviously, you can you can put it entirely up for free, um, and some people would advocate that. I think some young early career writers would you know, are so eager to have their work done that they're willing to you know oh, it's wonderful that somebody sings my song. The problem is once it's out there, especially once the sheet is out there for free, it's very it's, it's out the door, and it's very difficult to shut the door later. Um, so certainly I think it's okay to, to give away a little piece of it for free, as I said in the article, so that people know who you are. Because if it's entirely locked behind a paid system and you haven't, and no, literally no one knows who you are, you, you don't have a, a presence, you're not known even in the theater world or the music world or what have you, uh, you need to do your own marketing, and so it's helpful to obviously have samples. Um, I think probably the easiest way is to have streaming samples, and if people like it, then they can buy it. You can do a, um, I don't advocate for any particular site or program because we're our own <laughs> publisher as well, but 
but there are a number of avenues you can do to pursue that. There's um, uh, there's uh, SoundCloud or Band, which will stream for free. There's Bandcamp where you can set a either a specific price or a pay what you can price. Uh, there's TuneCore which lets you upload things to iTunes and Amazon and or Spotify, all these sites. Uh, I recently looked and they've got I think 80 some stores now. Some of them aren't a pay-to-listen thing. A lot of them are streaming, which do pay, but in a different way. So, uh, and then there's YouTube because, you know, the other thing that you didn't mention is that, you know, a lot of the ways that people Absolutely. knew to sing your songs at all is is the is the YouTube videos of people yeah. singing your song. I mean, you were obviously yeah. they were getting performed all over the place. No, it's but. That's how they found out about it. They watch the video, they say, I want to sing that song, and they go and buy the sheet music. And it's frankly the best indicator of whether or not some, whether or not sheet music is going to sell for us or other writers. Sure. In our experience. And right. the That's main metric we actually use when determining who should be on the site yeah. is YouTube views. Can I ask a sensitive question? Sure. So are there... Um, are well, there on the <laughs> panel, right? <laughs> 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 they said it's about a personal problem. So. Yeah. It's no problem. Um, and I'm just curious, but I, I mean, I'm assuming that there are probably some less quality performances of your material sure. online. I would, That's I a would safe assumption. That. <laughs> <laughs> I, didn't want to, I didn't want to use I think it's safe before. to assume there are poor quality performances <laughs> of any song. Everything. Everything. Yeah. Everything. Yeah. Everything. Let it go. I think, the, right now. <laughs> I think the Great American Songbook has taken some hits yeah. as well. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's rough out there. Are there, are there. Is there value to those? Absolutely. Just as yeah. Much as the, yeah. Yeah. There, yeah. There's certainly value to the performances, and uh, I think it, the, the the contrast that I was trying to draw in the art in the article that I wrote though was when it's the it's the video that you're choosing to promote of mm -hmm. of, of your work. So if you have uh, obviously a good quality performance, even if it's a live performance, great. That that tends to be as I mean, you guys have lucked out on that in a lot of ways, but. A lot of people, you know, they, they think, great, so-and-so singing my song at this cabaret show. I should video, you know, I should do the video. I should put the video up. Maybe. <laughs> I mean, Absolutely. Of, often in those cases, you know, you may get someone who's, you know, a prominent performer even to do it, but they may not have had more than an hour's rehearsal, and so no fault of their own, it's not going to be that good. And so the question is, is that the thing you should choose yourself in how to promote your work? Once the work is out there, there can be any number of covers that are good, bad, and indifferent. I want to say that Kate and I are very concerned and very, like, we, we, we talk a lot about our digital footprint, and we talk a lot about, like, quality control in our, in our work and in our site's work, mm -hmm. and there are times when we have a really, really tight gate on it, and, like, we, we never release all of the footage from our concerts. Like, we, we, we curate it, and we really are careful with what we let out there, and then we think there's absolutely a time when you want all hands on deck and like there are times when we encourage all of our fans all of our supporters everybody record a video like and it, but it's not necessarily being released through our channel mm -hmm. right. directly you know there's a there's a time to sing let it go into your computer screen <laughs> um, but that, that's not necessarily <laughs> something every yeah, morning every but morning. You, but you're not necessarily going to charge to see that performance you're not necessarily well, and Disney is not going is going to say please record it all the times that you yeah, want to record absolutely. it but like I, we aren't going to put it on our website yeah. Yeah. There's, there's, um, there's also a difference uh, not to get into too much of the, the, the payment issue, but there is a difference in YouTube, depending on how you monetize it, whether the video is something that you have officially put up in your channel versus some other user-generated content. Um, and whether you opt in to different ad services that will place ads either around or in it, um, that sort of thing. So, you know, you can still make something off of, you know, someone recording it off their computer screen in their bedroom but you'll probably make more if it's on your official channel and you've opted into the ad service and all that. Yeah. Okay. So how are, I guess my question is, as a publisher, um, a traditional publisher who's dealing with um, you know, the older pre-internet model where exposure to a new play was really through kind of a theme, buy the book, you go to drum <laughs> bookshop or you go to, you get your big Samuel French catalog in the mail and then you flip through, oh, that sounds good. Um, how are these new models changing relationships with that kind of traditional model? Um, like, do people need agents anymore? Is this getting more people agents? Are these getting, like, are there thoughts on that or? Well, I, I, I'll just jump in. Um, I imagine people still need agents. Um, I mean, I'm the person 
on the panel and maybe one of the few in the room who doesn't make a living as a theater artist, writer, any yeah. kind of writer. I mean, I, I, we're solely, we run a nonprofit company to serve the community. So I don't, I've never had the problem of trying to get an agent. Mm -hmm. um, but my sense from talking to all the people that we deal with is that agents seem to be important to people. Um, I think that, um, you know, we've always viewed our mission as trying to sort of be the entry point for you know, and, and kind of, you know, we, we always kind of joke, you know, that we haven't invited Tony Kushner to be on Indie Theater now. If he wants to be on it, he's welcome, but it's kind of, we think he's on his own, you know. I mean, I mean, people, you know, we're not looking to service people that have reached a level of stature in their career. We're, we're trying to help people at the beginning. Um, I mean, when you talk about sort of the relationship between digital publishing and sort of traditional print publishing, I mean, we concluded as a person, as a company who pretty much have stopped being a print publisher as of, I think the last anthology we published, which was one we did earlier this year, um, is that just it just doesn't make sense from a money standpoint to do print publishing for new work, new work of the kind that we focus on. I'm be very clear about that. I'm positive it makes sense to publish the works of Shakespeare. I'm positive that it makes sense to publish the works of Burton Wilder and many, many other wonderful established playwrights. But I'm also positive that there's no money to be made publishing the works of undiscovered unrepresented playwrights, which is why we're a nonprofit trying to, you know, use our resources to get those people to a different place in their career. Um, so I, don't, I feel like I'm sort of rambling, but that was No, it's right. I mean, do you have thoughts, because I know you guys, um, um, New Play Exchange has been doing seminars. Can I call them seminars? Uh, yeah, some of them have been seminar-like. Yeah, seminar-like. <laughs> <laughs> there are a couple in this very room. Yeah, yeah. We've been yeah. meeting with theater professionals around the country, either uh, in identity groups, so all the world's literary managers and dramaturgs in one room, playwrights in another room, et cetera, and then lots of mixed groups as well. Uh, and we did uh, convene one gathering of agents here in New York, um, uh, including my own. So I, I walked down the hall from meeting with her and brought her with me and gathered 30 others in a room and told them all about the new play exchange. And uh, we are not putting any agent out of business anytime soon or, or ever. Um, I think they feel and we agree that our tool is going to be incredibly useful for them. It's a new, just a new way for people to find their client's work and, and when they find the, their client's work, having found it with a particular mindset that I was looking for exactly this kind of thing and here it is and here's my contact information, here's my representative's phone number and email address so that I can immediately reach out and make a connection. Uh, they, they think it's going to be a tool for um, that elusive second production for their clients, uh, which is great. Uh, and I, I, I hope it is. I really do. Is the goal to have people, um, I mean, well, do you think agents will one day use this to discover new writers? I, it's possible. It really is possible. I, I mean, we are in such a place now of experimentation and learning and beta testing. And um, I'm, I've built technology now for a couple of decades, so I've acquired a healthy humility about what it is to release a new platform into the wild. Uh, the world is going to teach me about what we did. And, I, and say, yeah, you know what, look what you did here. You didn't think you were doing this, but you did. And there'll be unintended consequences and things we're going to have to learn from and adapt to. So. It may be, I de I know, I'm 100% I'm certain we're not going to put agents out of business. What, what, <laughs> no, what might actually happen is agents say, you know what, I find, find this feature particularly useful in this way you hadn't considered. Can you tweak it this way and that way so I can really use it? And then we'll be like, great, awesome. Great. Our intent is to serve the American theater. Uh, and so if it's useful for folks, that's what we want to do. We are, we're a nonprofit as well. We're not out to make a buck. Uh, we're out to serve. Do you guys have thoughts on how it's changing relationships? I, have, I don't know if this, I mean, the thing that I feel lately, and Kate, you can totally correct me, is that it, it's a very strange sensation of having this, like having all of these direct connections with people who want to perform our work. Um, we have like a, a global network of like, we have people in the Philippines who just like want to sing our songs, and we have actors in the Midwest, and lots and lots of students who want to do our work. And we don't really have relationships with people who run those programs. And we don't have relationships with small theaters. And like, we make, a, we make a living as writers, not like a great living, but like Kate and I are professional writers. And yet like, a lot of those 
normal first routes to like who would be the first line of people who you have a business relationship with are not at all who our relationships are with. And, there's, and there have been some repercussions to that, and we're trying to, it's something that we're now actively trying to figure out how to then have relationships <laughs> with these, mm -hmm. especially like very small theaters and very small. Like all um, your students like us, how do you get to this? Yeah, <laughs> like you're not necessarily on the internet. And that's um, not connected to your agent exactly, because your no. agent is connected no. to the more professional side of your career, and that's sort of, so it's almost, for us it's been a little bit bisected, and I think a lot of the people who are in, at least in musical theater, I don't know as much with plays, I think that because musical theater has a very commercial bent to it, at least a little bit, there's, um, there's a lot of us who are, the way that we've figured out that we can make our living is to be connecting with, with people who are buying sheet music from us. And, and that puts us in a really interesting position over here, and it almost feels completely disconnected from our actual, like, the professional trajectory of the new shows that we're trying to write. The songs are from those new shows. Yeah. But we're theater artists. <laughs> like, we are. We it's swear. A really, it's a weird yes. thing. It takes a really long time to get a show produced, and so you end up doing this thing on the side over here. Um, and at, most of our friends, most of the people who are writing, or our contemporaries, are doing the exact same thing. And just to clarify, because I should have actually clarified this early on, that none of these platforms can bar you from traditional publishing and licensing relationships. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Correct. Non-exclusive. Not at all. None. Yeah. yeah. So there it was very important to, to us as we set it up. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, for instance, I have some writer clients who I publish, and we have a deal with NewMusicalTheater.com so that they can sell their music via their site as well as all the other places we license their music to. Great. I would, I would say that about the agent relationship, there's sort of three primary functions that an agent or a publisher has, or at least a frontline publisher. One is finding the talent, one is promoting the work, and mm -hmm. one is making the deal. And I think the, the value of these sorts of services are fi helping to find the talent and helping to promote it to some extent. Um, it's not obviously doing the deal. And okay. when you have a situation where you get a, an actual production opportunity, particularly with a, you know, a, a professional theater, it's very important to have somebody to you know, help you make that deal, whether it's an experienced lawyer in the theater world or an agent or someone, so that, as the Dramatist Guild always says, you know, don't sign, or anyone, don't sign anything mm -hmm. without having somebody yeah. smarter than you look at it, <laughs> or at least smarter than you in a different way. So, so I think, um, you know, the, the music business um, has obviously used uh, online services to try and find talent as well. Uh, a lot of record labels in particular have, um, you know, people who, sp interns who spend a lot of time um, I've seen some of these rooms where they, it's, it's pretty amazing. They have like a dozen people in a room and they spend all day on YouTube and blogs and other stuff scouting songwriting talent or, or artist talent, I should say. Um, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. You know, the, somebody who can have a, there are a number of people who have huge YouTube or online followings, you know, tens of hundreds of millions of hits on multiple videos. Um, they tend to be performers in their late teens, early 20s, they are mostly singing covers of pop songs. Mm -hmm. And so they have these fan bases. Some of them tour and make a lot of money selling concert tickets. Um, you know, they're not touring arenas, but they're touring, you know, decent venues. Um, there have been not very many situations where those, that sort of thing has translated into uh, recording income or publishing income. Um, you know, be, partly because they're doing covers, but even when they start, some of them started, started to do their own material, and then there's still a following, but not as much. So I'm not putting it down. I think it's great to be out there, and a lot of the videos are very high quality. Um, but, um, you know, there, I, I only know a handful who have translated that into the kind of income that would sustain them just from, you know, sort of an online presence kind of thing. I mean, I think the... the um, the income that you make from you know doing selling your songs, whether it's sheet music or, or videos or what have you, for a theater writer is great. It can be very lucrative, certainly, um, but of course it's a it's a much better thing to get a production of your work because royalty wise you're obviously <laughs> going to make a lot more, yeah. and and career wise you're going to progress yeah. mm -hmm. more than that. That's yeah. That's that segues. We're having good 
Yes. Organic flow. Yes. Uh, but I also want to bring up, because uh, when I've been to these convenings at the org, you know, I, t I talk to a lot of writers and we talk about, you know, should I do this? Should I not do this? What does this mean? And I think there still is a, a, a vibe or a question in people's mind about the security of these platforms. Um, you know, you guys had mentioned this large fan base, but not necessarily being able to access the theaters. Um, you know, what does that mean in terms of protection of your material, and how do you, I mean, is that something that the writer has to take on themselves and monitor, or there? Well, in terms of the sheet music that we sell on the site, um, you are able to download the, you're able to download the sheet music, but um, as, as, a, as a customer, you're able to download, sh download the sheet music, but um, in order to open the file, you have to put your password, you have to put a password in, and the password is your credit card information. So you might share that with your, most of, the, most of them are teenagers. You might share that with your mom, but you're probably not going to share it with anyone else. It probably was your mom's. It probably was your mom's. Let's be fair. And then even if you, even if you did share that, um, you could then, once, once you open the file, the file has your name watermarked on the sheet music. Um, so you could totally work around that. There are very, like, really even very, like, analog solutions to working around that. Which we that won't discuss. We yeah. won't discuss <laughs> that because I don't want to talk about that. But, but, yeah. but like, you, there, are, there are things that make it very hard to, to share, to pirate the music. You but, can set up barriers to that. There's, there's very few foolproof kinds right. of things. And yeah. even, um, you know, iTunes and Amazon did away with the DRM on their, mm. the tracks that they sell a little while ago. You know, there's still, I believe there's still fairly heavy DRM on videos. Can you define DRM? But, uh, digital, digital, digital rights, rights management. management. So it's it's the kind of thing that almost everybody doesn't like who isn't in the intellectual right. property business. We like it, but. Yeah. <laughs> Basically, you're just making but, it really inconvenient yeah. to. But it's, and for it's, us, it's, that's. It's, <laughs> and other sites have, like, you can print it only once. Right. Yeah. Or other sites have it, it self destructs in a certain way. Self destructs, yeah. 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 And that's part of it for us, and another part of it is advocacy. Um, and the third part that we also talk about is just making sure that things that people want are available at all, because that's yeah. one of the largest drivers of piracy as far as we're concerned. Um, so we think that, like, in general, it's great that, like, we're all just making things available that mm -hmm. people should want, or in some cases, that we think they should want. Yeah. Um, but, like, there's kind of... It, we sit on a piracy committee here at the Dramatist Guild with uh, Sean and with some other writers um, that's led by Craig Carnelia and did a um, piracy, um, oh, what was it called? Blast. Like a ship's blast. ahoy, a blast. No, yeah. We did <laughs> pirate a pirate blast. blast here in this very room a couple months ago, and it's been wonderful. We spend a lot of time sitting around and talking about um, both the DRM side of it, but mostly about the advocacy, advocacy side. And really talking about you know, the fact that if, if we, have that, we have the expectation, and we're not even teenagers, that if I look on the internet, I should basically find teenagers, something. We're basically teenagers. Really. teenagers. But, um, but I, if I look on the internet for something, I expect to be able to find it. And if I can't, I get frustrated very quickly. And so if, I, like, if, if, if you can't buy something and you want to be able to access it, even as, it, like, as it, I, teach, I teach a libretto writing course, and like, there's nothing that's harder to find anywhere than librettos. And so I end up emailing writers and asking to borrow their libretto and telling them that I'm going to make a couple photocopies for my students to look at hard copies of. But like, I'm doing, I'm, you know, they're saying it's okay, but I really wish that wasn't the way that I had to do it. Like, I should just tell my students to buy this libretto, which I would totally do, but I can't because it's not available on the internet for the most part. So that's... It's yeah. It's like it's a it's 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 hard. It's confusing. Do you feel like I know you probably addressed the security question in your yeah you know seminars the right <laughs> in my seminars. <laughs> I don't uh, know what to call those. The writers we've been meeting with around the country, and I, I I've probably met feels like a thousand now at this point. They're mostly um, playwrights rather than musical theater writers. Um, they the, I, I talk a lot about uh, people my age and above are really concerned about privacy and they don't want the script available and we've set up the new play exchange so that you can create an entry for your play and not add the script. You can add a little sample, you can add a synopsis, you can add the information about the script and then require someone to contact you if they want to read it. And people younger than me are like, put the script up there. 
And these are represented people and unrepresented people. These are, you know, they just, they, they, information wants to be free. If there's an unlicensed production of their work in um, Zaire, great, they don't care, you know. Uh, you know, they, in the age of the Google alert about your work, when you can have that, set that up, you're always going to find out about anything. Um, just be savvy and be smart. And so I, you know, I personally, my emotionally, I can see both perspectives, yeah. and um, and I live right in the that vague center. I tend to side with the younger folk, um, but I totally see the other perspective. And if you look at my profile in New Play Exchange, you'll see there's about half and half of my work. <laughs> the published work is not there because I would not do a disservice to my publisher by putting a, a, a free-ish accessible copy of it up there. The unpublished work, some of it is up there and some of it isn't. And it's really about what I'm feeling like. Um, you know, is it's not, not logic. Sorry to... Um, yeah. Is there some concern about what you put online being the finished edition? I know we wrestle with that question at French um, because, you know, a lot of playwrights these days and historically go back and kind of change the work as they see new productions or... Mm -hmm. You know, we have plays that mention MySpace. Well, we, <laughs> we, we, always, we, we have a rule always that playwrights can revise the work. I mean, not every week, but, oh, um, but you know, certainly we're happy to put up new versions as, as the, play, the plays develop. And I've actually been, you know, I think maybe not too high pressure, but trying to encourage people to put work up even, you know, as it's just being performed for the first time, so that it gets the exposure. I mean, one of the things we can talk, I didn't talk about this before, but it's called Indie Theater Now for a very specific reason, and that is that we're publishing plays as they're being presented for the first time. So, like, there is a play that opened, um, or it opens, I guess, tonight at the Midtown International Theater Festival, not a famous venue, but, but a real one, and with that play is published on Indie Theater Now. It's the world premiere of the play. And I know he wants to revise it after he sees the first run, and he will, and that's great. But at least the work is available for people to see. And in fact, this guy already got a production written from the work that's on our site. So it, the idea works. I wanted to also just talk about what, what he was just talking about, too, because it's really important to me. Um, and that's this idea of um, making sure that the work is secure and is safe. And I mean, we, I'm very much a fervent believer in the rights of any creator to be able to profit from their work. I do not, I get mad at the New York Times that it wants to charge me to read their articles. But they're right. I mean, <laughs> what they did wrong was give them away for free for a really long time so that I'm mad now. If they'd always charged me, I wouldn't, because they yeah. used to charge me. Used to yeah. pay for mm -hmm. So I, Indie Theater Now is set up right from the start to be protective in, in, its, in its own way of the, of the rights of these playwrights. We have a proprietary uh, reader that we developed that is meant to be a reader of the mm -hmm. plays. It is not an acting copy by any means of the play. You could fashion, you could sit and print screens and cobble together an acting copy of the thing, but that would be really a lot of work. I mean, you could do it, but it would be a lot of work. I would be smarter to contact Playwright and try to work something out with the Playwright, and we provide all that contact information on the site. Um, we chose the iTunes pricing model. And that's why the play is cost dollar twenty nine. It was not a, a guess, it was the iTunes price. Because our thought was that our main market is probably younger people and especially kids in schools, because that's really our yeah. main market are people who are reading these plays in colleges. And they think nothing of spending a dollar twenty nine for assigned work or for, for work they're going to use for their own purposes. And we've got, you know, one one of our absolute best selling play is a play by a guy who teaches in this area and he teaches a course in theater at a number of schools uh, in the New York City area, and he charged, and he, he always used to give his play away uh, no, to, and now he gets 30 cents every time one of the students buy it, and they all will buy it because it's only $1.29. And we can always tell when he's teaching it because they'll be damn like 17 <laughs> copies of the play um, because the kids don't buy it in advance, that's for sure. So, but I think it's really, you know, I think it's really important to protect, we, we've met with a number of groups of playwrights, I'm sorry if I'm going on too long, but we've met with a number of groups of playwrights, and what I hear from the folks we talk to is, and it's not really so much age-related is just what we give them. It's everybody, everybody that we work with, obviously, is happy to let people have a reading copy of the play for the $1.29, but almost no one that we work with wants a PDF out there. Mm -hmm. They don't want a printable, usable, actable copy. They <laughs> want that to be theirs to control. And as we don't do licensing, and we're not interested in getting into that business, you know, that is great with us. But, you know, it does limit, in a way, some of the use of usability of what we're doing on the site. But again, our purpose is to introduce the work to, mm -hmm. to anybody who wants to get introduced to it. Can, you, can I ask a question? Can you read yeah. it on a tablet? 
You can read it on anything that can connect to the internet. Okay. Yeah. So but it's, you it's not that you have to sit and read it on the screen of your laptop. No, 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 no. You can read it like on your phone. Right. I mean, I would, but you can. <laughs> but you, right. but what you have to be is connected because you cannot download it. Yeah, oh, and you I can't. Yeah, so oh, you can't I read it on the subway. I see. Gotcha. Unless you're really lucky. <laughs> <laughs> they live in DC where we have this. <laughs> yeah. uh, I have one more question and I want to turn it over to everyone um, for larger questions. But um, for those of you that are artists as well as kind of digital innovators, um, <laughs> how does this work with an author's own website? Um, you, I'm assuming that you have your own websites and then you're also using these other platforms. I mean, does that become cumbersome? Do you find that you get more traffic to your website? from other platforms. Do you recommend that playwrights have multiple accounts with various, as, as many accounts as possible, or is it about... I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I, no, I mean, we have we have newmusicaltheater.com, which brings in very different people, and, and, and different people might find our work because of that, because they're looking for another artist's work, and so that's great. And... Uh, being on YouTube and you, our YouTube account is one of our biggest ways that people find us and that happens through probably through Google sometimes and then sometimes it's just through YouTube and then it's people who are subscribers of our page and then we have a website which in, there are moments where I wonder whether or not that's actually worthwhile given all of the different platforms that people now use but we made our website something that is sort of its own beast and has its own Identity. We keep all of our lyrics um, for all of our songs uh, on on our on our website, and we house them there. And so that's something that we know that people are looking for. And so we may we know yeah. that people will go to our website for certain things. And so it seems useful, but we can't help it's it. A we lot. have a front seat. We have a front row seat from our perch at New Musical Theater, and so we can't help but like translate the best practices we figure out over there to our own work. And so, like when we went about like finally like fixing our website last year, it was if you searched for us, it came up as like Kentucky off track betting um, yes. because like I, something it's happened terrible. and we couldn't fix it. But we finally did, and it was really interesting. We like looked at our Google Analytics, which I recommend everybody install because it's free and simple. And we were like, oh wow, everyone just wants the lyrics to our songs like this is what this is the way they're finding us and you're giving those away yeah yeah and so we just like put all our lyrics up on yeah. our site but at least they're not somebody else who's getting the traffic right. and so we put yeah. it up on us and they're accurate yeah. um and when they change we, we update change them. them and I, I did want the chance to respond to your last question which oh, is sorry. that like no 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 I just to say that i've gone so accustomed to changing my work at mm. will and like mm -hmm. we have three different versions of some of our songs online because you know, like, it's really hard. People don't want you to take away their old one. and they like really you, liked that key change. They really liked the old one that you didn't like very much that had the really bad lyrics. Like, what are you going to do? And so, like, you leave, we leave that up there, but we actually even call it, like, preferred version. And, or like, something. retired version. We call it, like, here. don't sing this song, but here, fine, because you... Stop <laughs> emailing me. <laughs> Um, no, but it's a, it's a weird thing to think about, like, the first time we're in, like, physical print, like, yeah. we're, we talk about, we're, but, like, that's a weird thing, like, we just can't just change it yeah. when we want to, yeah. like, I don't know, what do you, like, do you have writers who, like, what, we're gonna be, we're gonna be awful to deal with when we have a print, if we have a print deal, if books aren't just all gone, um, because I want to be able to change it. Well, some of the print publishers, uh, Alfred and Hal Leonard, now have... Uh, digital print services mm -hmm. where it's it's not quite it's more than print on demand but it's it's very they can do very small quantities of a very nice looking book it's almost yeah. indistinguishable from uh, what you would buy if they made 10,000 of them mm -hmm. yeah. but for even though sheet music is very popular for theater still physical sheet music um, it's not as big a business as it used to be and so the marketability of, let's say, a vocal selections folio of an off-Broadway show that's closed is limited. Yeah. And so, you know, but, but that's not to say we shouldn't have it there. So we right. always put the songs up digitally for individual sale where there's a number of different sites. And we also try and, you know, make, make it so that it's available. So if there is a, a marked demand for it, then they can make a hundred of them and sell those. And they don't need to have the same print run press point because so I think Mark was saying, you know, in the print, in the, the cost of paper and binding and all of that is just prohibitive in, yeah. in many cases. Typesetting. So, yeah. yeah. Um, well, I wanted to, the, the other question you were asking about. About websites. About yeah. websites, yeah. So, 
I always encourage the writers I represent, um, particularly the younger ones, to have a website, to have it look <clears throat> at least basic and decent, um, and to have a consistent name uh, for the domain name and their Twitter handle and their YouTube channel and their Facebook, if they have a professional, you know, fan page or whatever, so that people always know, even if they're not, no matter how they're going at it, they're always finding that person. Um, you know, the, the, and then of course there are links on there to purchase their music in many different ways from many different sites. Um, I have an example, well, it's interesting though because what you were saying about the website, I think uh, different people have different things, like uh, I represent mm -hmm. Lemuel Miranda, who has a huge social media following, mainly because he's very active on it, he's on there many times a day. And so he did this 15-minute um, musical for Ira Glass on This American Life a few weeks ago. And uh, it was performed live at BAM and they did a video and they sold the video on the This American Life website. Ira Glass and Lynn emailed me and said, we want to, we're going to go into the studio, the day after they shot the thing, or maybe it's a couple days later, they went into a studio and recorded the cast album EP of five tracks of this 15 minute show. Uh, the, you know, the video is great, I would encourage everyone to buy the video. Um, the, the album is also great, the audio quality on the album is better than it is in the video because they had time in the studio to do yeah. it. But we were able to, we published his songs, uh, he wanted to self-release the audio. It was too short a timetable to get a label involved in that sense because it was three days. Mm -hmm. But we got it up on iTunes in three days wow. and Amazon. So, and, and it, was, it debuted at number 10 on the cast albums chart because oh people, because he tweeted it and mm -hmm. he has 50 some thousand Twitter followers and that's where they found it. They didn't follow it by going to his website. Right. I mean, I, I consult for arts organizations and artists about digital communication strategy. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I think at this point, we're living in a world where having a competent website is tantamount to what having a competent CV was about a decade or a generation ago. You kind of have to, yeah. and it's really not that hard. It requires maybe a mental leap to decide <laughs> that you can do it. But you can do it. You can do it for a hundred bucks and a and a lost weekend, right? Um, and, and, you, you have know, to drink while you're doing. You do. You know, or you can hire somebody fancy to do it for you. But it's just you know, do it yourself. Um, having said that, I think it's important to uh, not get overwhelmed, uh, and so I tell you know, the artists that I work with, to pick a channel and go deep rather than try and do nine channels mm -hmm. shallowly. Or pick three channels and go deep. Uh, you know, my channel, as many of you know, is Twitter, and I spend a lot of time there, and I've got a following there, and it's worked for me. Um, and I also have a rather robust website that, you know, because I can't not. And I also play around with every new platform that comes out because I have to know them. But uh, I can't. I can't devote my life to that. I really yeah, have to make it right. work, and, and <laughs> you know that's important too. <laughs> so, yeah. So I'm going to turn it over to the audience. Um, so we're about about a half an hour. Oh yay! Um, so let's start. You raised your hand first. Um, the mint gentleman in the white hat. Okay. Firstly, I want to say that I appreciate and I value what you guys are doing. The world is going in technology direction, and that's important. A lot of people want to be sites that don't read the terms and conditions, rules, regulations, but it's usually a clause that they're granting the site perpetual rights. And if it's not there, it should be there. Because someone could come around later on and sue you, you know, they didn't take the work down, you had it on your site. My question is, what repercussions does that have for the person who's posting their work on your site. So this is a question about perpetual rights and what repercussions do they have for people posting your work? I mean, basically the way we do it is that the playwright has the right to take the work down anytime they want after it's been up for six months. We ask them to give, give it six months because there's a certain amount of investment that we've made in more time and resources. But after six months, playwrights can take the piece down for any reason, no questions asked. The only condition is, is that anybody who's purchased one of their digital plays for $1.29 gets to keep the play forever. Um, but other than that, 
the play's gone. So it's, I think it, it's a pretty fair arrangement. We Price don't ask for perpetual rights at all. Mm -hmm. The artist can take it down six seconds and after they put it up. What if they don't? And it's their great great grandson. What 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 are you asking? Uh, what if a future generation finds their grandfather's work on your site? What protection do you? Like I said, there is value to that. But we're not making any money off of it, so I, you know, there's not, uh, there's not. We don't need protection. Yeah, we have an agreement. Yeah. We have signed agreements, not digital, but like actual real signed agreements yeah. with every single playwright. So if the grandson, I guess, asks us a question, we can show them the agreement. But that, is that something for writers to be mindful of? I guess as they explore these new well, platforms. Well, the, the terms that the, you know, in our case, the writers that we represent, they have a, a, an agreement with Warner Chapel, or mm -hmm. as you would with any other publisher. And that has either a, a certain term. It can be three years, it can be life of copyright, and a number of things. And then wherever that work appears is a license between the publisher and that site. So that license can be usually for a fixed amount of time. If a writer, in most, I think in most of our agreements, I shouldn't say all because I don't know for sure, but. If I, I know in, in a lot of them that I deal with, from, uh, if a writer doesn't want their work on a site, we usually have the right to pull it off, um, if for whatever reason. Sometimes they want to revise it, sometimes they want to, they, uh, who knows. Um, you know, some people don't want their work on certain sites out of, because they don't like the deal terms, they don't like the site itself, who knows. But we usually, I mean, I, I don't think a, I'm not sure websites are going to be around in their current form in <laughs> the 20 yeah, years, much less 100. The question is because uh, sites like Wattpad, uh, uh, Writer's Cafe, they have that clause. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. so, so they have the perpetual right to keep yes. it up? Wow. I wouldn't load my work there at all. Yeah. Well, and I think, but I think that's also because, I mean, Martin, you're in, you're, you've been in a, an, a major advocate, but for the rest of us, like, we're also writers, and, like, so, of course, from the very, like, from the very outset, that was a non-starter. Like, there just had to be something in it. Like, that was the, like... New Musical Theater is a for-profit company that's mostly trying to make a li make like a, a living or a